room here in this house. Yes. <laughs> well, um, good morning, good afternoon, and um, good evening to everyone who joined us today by connecting to Round the World platform. Uh, welcome to Horace's global event, and uh, thank you for so much for, your, for your investing your time with us. Uh, it's my pleasure to be moderator of the session uh, redirecting the World Trade Organization. This panel session will allow us to um, underscore certain recent and key developments, of course, in international trade, and in the role of the WTO, uh, the WTO's role, which has he has taken or it should take uh, in this global economic dynamism. Um, it will offer us perhaps an opportunity to concretize um, our knowledge um, and opinions on the functioning of the multilateral trading system. Uh, well, we can say in the midst of a global health crisis, which has led to um, social and economic devastation in many countries. Um, perhaps a unique aspect of this session is that it will be providing a multidimensional perspective, including both public and private um, sector representatives, let's say, influencing five different continents. It's uh, North America, South America, um, Africa, Europe, and even um, indirectly Asia through me. Well, indeed, today uh, we have Ambassador um, Jonathan Freed with us, uh, who has been playing a um, key role in developing international economic relations with Canada and representing Canada as, well, um, inter alia, uh, let's say, uh, ambassador of Canada in many countries, as permanent representative of Canada to the WTO and um, where he played a key role in um, multilateral trade negotiations and as deputy for Canada in G7 and G20 summits. Um, equally well known, but this time from South America, um, Ricardo Melendez Ortiz will be with sharing his insight on the topic with us. Um, he is the co-founder and the executive director of the International um, Center for Trade and Sustainable Development, which is based in Geneva. And he's also the co-founder of uh, Fundación Futuro Latino Americano, uh, based in Ecuador. Um, so Ricardo represented um, Colombia as permanent delegate in Geneva, as well as in many, many state negotiations, uh, such as the famous um, Uruguay round of WTO and several climate change related panels and conferences. And finally, uh, on the other side of the table, we have uh, Kola Adizina to cover the private sector perspective as a very successful businessman and a social entrepreneur. Um, he's the director of uh, Sahara, in, uh, which is a leading and international um, energy and infrastructure uh, company in, like, in many com uh, countries. Um, his uh, Sahara Power Group aims to boost sustainable development across Africa. Um, so Kola combines his years of management and business diplomacy experience into creating um, and executing uh, as well and innovative uh, strategies for governments across um, African states in the energy sector. And uh, finally, in, if I briefly introduce myself, uh, I'm an international trade lawyer. I'm based in Brussels. I'm representing WTO member states in their WTO-related trade disputes and advising governments in their trade negotiations, policy-making processes. And also another major part of my job relates to the trade defense we call uh, policies, whereby I constantly witness the level of state protectionism in international trade Therefore, I perhaps can also humbly contribute to providing a hybrid perspective in the discussion. Um, well, of course, it would be much more complete if we would also have at least one woman panelist in our session, which would doubtlessly bring along an invaluable contribution to our panel. Well, perhaps uh, we should also hope for more gender balanced panels from uh, Frank next year. Um, okay, so um, let me briefly mention the, the main headings of our session today. Um, we will cover, in general, three aspects. So the first is going to be trade and health. The second is going to be trade and environment. And the third is going to be interinstitutional public order of the WTO, also emphasizing um, the rising protectionism vis-a-vis uh, -vis multilateralism in the global trade order. So, uh, but before beginning to discuss these aspects in depth, perhaps um, it would be important to touch upon 
the appointment of the new director general of the WTO, which is a Nigerian, um, just like uh, Kola, um, Ms. Nugosi Okonyo Ireala and her team uh, in general. This is a new appointment given, given the United States, you know, blockage um, because the United States has been blocking this appointment for a while. Well, it appears that, in my opinion, the creases are finally ironed out. But uh, what I'm curious is what lessons are there from the previous DG um, Azevedo's tenure and what is our expectation from the new director general? So, Jonathan, would you like to briefly comment on this issue first? Well, thank you and thank you for inviting me to participate. Um, I'll try and be brief. Uh, Dr. Ngozi uh, is eminently qualified, and that's been universally uh, recognized, to take on uh, a major challenge. As the head of the WTO, she, in effect, is uh, having to perform three jobs in one. She is the chief operating officer of a major uh, secretariat. There's about seven, six to 700 people that need uh, to serve the interests of 164 members and thus uh, as head of the secretariat she has to ensure that it is responsive to the needs of all members. Uh, second, she is the chief public relations officer and has to uh, help educate our publics, our business community and others on the importance and value of the rules-based system for trade, which itself contributes to increasing prosperity in all the member countries. Um, uh, and uh, third, uh, she is uh, in effect the guiding uh, chief strategic officer uh, and has to do that in collaboration with members and thus engage in capitals, with capitals, with trade ministers uh, uh, at home, as well as with their chief representatives, the ambassadors in Geneva, to marshal uh, a consensus. Her wealth of experience at the World Bank in being the head of Gavi, in being quite comfortable in talking to heads of government, ministers, but not looking down on the professional officials, ambassadors or otherwise, makes her particularly well suited. And of course, as we turn to the topic of trade and health, her experience with Gavi and in this field in particular is particularly relevant at these times. So uh, she's given a sense, I think, collectively around the world of optimism uh, regarding the contribution the WTO can make in taking on the COVID challenge and building back better. So I'll stop there. Yes, uh, yes. thanks, Jonathan. I think, um, well, um, well, Ricardo and Cola, so with this um, comprehensive um, experience uh, that the new director general has, as described by Jonathan, um, and given that the, the new director general has already signaled um, her support, let's say, towards sustainable development, uh, and of developing countries, especially in South America and Africa, and that she emphasizes in almost all platforms that the global production capacity in developing countries uh, should be increased. Are you, in general terms, hopeful about this point? Okay, yeah, first uh, I want to say a big thank you uh, for the privilege of this invitation. Um, it's well um, appreciated. Um, Dr. Okonjo Iweala, like um, Jonathan said, uh, she's eminently qualified. Uh, she ticks the major boxes that is required for a role like this, credibility, capacity, and competence. So invariably for me, she has all it takes uh, to lead the organization at this point in time. Um, I did find quite exciting the fact that uh, uh, President Donald Trump had a combative response uh, at that point in time uh, by blocking her uh, appointment. I think that was a very major issue that uh, needed not have happened in the first instance, but we're glad uh, we're out of that uh, particular issue uh, today. We thank uh, the President, uh, 
Joe Biden for giving her the nod that is required. However, there is something here with regards to Joe Biden himself. His focus is actually more internal as well because he intends to build back better uh, by way of his agenda uh, for his own country. So there's domestic recovery. That is the key highlight of his own um, administration. Now, in terms of the question you asked, um, one of the things I find a bit uh, very strange and awkward that needs to be addressed and addressed quickly, we cannot import the UN mentality into WTO where you have one person, one, one country, uh, veto the act of 163 nations. A decision has been taken by 163 countries and one country singularly blocked uh, Dr. Uh, Iweala's uh, appointment. I think that's something that the world needs to deal with at the world uh, the, uh, the trade organization level because this is trade. And this is a trade. This is uh, something that deals more with multilateralism than any other thing. It's not a unilateral thing. It's not bilateral. It's for everybody. So I believe uh, that is something that needs to be cured uh, sooner than later. Thirdly, uh, because the world is not on the same pedestal at this point in time, it's important that there is realization and full understanding of where the world is in the different parts um, that exist today. Uh, the level of prosperity is not the same. The level of knowledge is not the same. Industrialization is not the same. Uh, infrastructure is not the same. So those basic ingredients required for world trade to move seamlessly are not universal in nature. So invariably, there is a need for total and deep understanding of the state of affairs in the different parts of the world. And highlighting that is for us to really understand what do we need for uh, continents like Africa, for instance, where there is endemic poverty and unemployment, how do we ensure that the activities of a rule-based organization like WTO does not affect Africa? How do we find a way of equalizing and democratizing prosperity? I think that's a question uh, that I would want uh, the WTO to answer. And speaking about that, when you look at the pandemic, uh, the pandemic has shown the entire world that we are not on the same level at all. If you look at the number of people that are vaccinated in Africa, the percentage yes, is yes. so horrendous compared yes. to what is happening everywhere else in the world. So attention needs to be paid where attention is required because no country can stand nor do this thing alone. So we need a united front. We need to come together with our best skills and the best strategy, noting the risk that we all have in the different locations of the world. Perfect. And uh, Ricardo, would you like to say a few words on that as well? I think you, you're muted. Yeah. That's probably the unacceptable mistake at this, I mean, after so many months of, um, of zooming. Um, I, I was just saying that just very briefly, because both Jonathan and Cola have been um, um, very comprehensive in their view, uh, I just say that, of, of course, I agree with um, uh, their regard of, uh, of, of Dr. Ngozi. Uh, I think that it is uh, a great choice. She's a force of nature. She has demonstrated this in the past few weeks that she's been in the post. Um, the, the question I think that you were focusing on is with respect to COVID and the recovery, but particularly the role of the trade system uh, on addressing the, the COVID issue. And I think as colleague was just said, the most difficult uh, situation right now is the question of inequality, uh, the, what we have seen in the, in the scrabble for vaccines and before that uh, for our other uh, medical supplies and so on, the kind of, of, of um, knee-jerk reaction that many countries have had uh, to um, uh, in, the, in this past 18 months or so uh, to, to, the, to addressing the pandemic through trade. I mean, I, I think we know, I think that we, we have to draw lessons here. We know that uh, uh, globalization and international trade is absolutely critical to ensure resilience, uh, to ensure supplies. Uh, there are countries that are drawing other lessons. They think that is about self-sufficiency. I think that, that what we have seen is that it's critical to have efficient 
uh, markets that really supply the, the goods that are needed when they're needed. And, and that, that's probably the biggest lesson that, that we have, that we have to draw from here. Now on the vaccines and going forward, because not, we're not out of this yet, and particularly in the global south. Uh, and, and I talk about the, the, my, my region in Latin America, uh, in particular at this moment, uh, the, the situation is, um, is critical. Uh, we need to be more, much more efficient in uh, setting up manufacturing capacity, distribution, uh, the, the deployment again of, um, of equipment and so on to try to, to combat um, uh, the pandemic at this stage. And uh, then the, there has been, in the past few weeks, as you all know, this discussion at the WTO with respect to a waiver uh, of, of patents uh, that are related to the vaccine. Uh, and uh, Dr. Wong, I think, has been very, very clear about um, her view on this with her experience. Uh, patents are not necessarily the only problem. There is a problem with pricing. We know now this very clearly. Uh, we need um, to have better uh, agreements and better arrangements uh, for the distribution of, of vaccines uh, and the manufacturing to, to uh, scale up manufacturing. Um, and we need to do that now. We cannot wait six months until the WTO gets um, its act together, so to speak, and uh, get all countries in agreement, uh, particularly on, on, that, on, the, on the waiver thing. My concern is that the waiver uh, discussion becomes a distraction. And, uh, and I, I think that that's very clear again, again to Dr. Ngozi, and so she's, she's acting on this. Well, thank you, Ricardo. I think we all agree that this appointment was a very promising development. But having this on mind, and also, as you uh, already stressed upon the trade and health issues, well, um, let's continue with kind of a bit reversing uh, with Jonathan, uh, and kind of uh, perhaps he also would like to say some uh, certain things about, you know, the relationship between trade and public health in general, and how does he see WTO's, you know, purpose and the, you know, rules-based trade and its um, impact on public health, not only within the scope of COVID uh, vaccines, of course, but as uh, Ricardo said, you know, what did the world experience during COVID and what are your, you know, post-COVID projections? Um, well, also, I assume that uh, some participants may question why are some regions are four times faster in, you know, um, receiving uh, health supplies and in, which includes vaccination, of course, than, than others. There's the WTO, which ensures uh, fair trade among nations. Uh, well, um, I, um, I leave the, the microphone to Jonathan to comment in general and health as well. Well, uh, let me try and be brief uh, because we do want to talk about uh, other public, uh, yeah. public challenges here. Uh, Ricardo captured it. If you think about what we've learned in tackling COVID, it's a combination of medical equipment and supplies, oxygen tanks, ventilators, uh, vaccines, uh, and delivery mechanisms, along with the skill sets that are needed to distribute and put, uh, put them in patient hands. Uh, we've seen uh, a number of countries, with some justification, say, I don't want, I can't afford to share with others until I look after my own population. And under WTO rules, uh, when there is a public emergency, it is perfectly legitimate for a country to say, I will put my citizens first. Finding the balance between responding to those immediate challenges at home while keeping the system open is for the WTO to resolve. And we've seen from the G7, the G20, informal groups of middle powers, a very common approach, which is not to say we're going to ban countries from looking after their own citizens, but rather, if you have to take a measure, it better be temporary. What you're doing better be transparent. And it better be proportionate only to the need and not a disguised protectionism. And it better be removed as soon as possible. The WTO, under the Director General's leadership, has provided a forum to consolidate that common understanding. 
so as not to create bottlenecks in supply chains. And I'll finish up by just coming back to something Ricardo said about the vaccines, and that is, as Dr. Uh, Ngozi has emphasized, look, what's most important is to ramp up production. And we know that takes an investment of people and capital. We know it takes 12 to 18 months for these new kinds of our DNA uh, vaccine facilities to be up and running and to ramp up uh, the volume of production. So let's collectively look at intellectual property, but at the same time, make sure in conjunction with the World Bank, other funders, and the private sector that we're looking at increasing global capacity. The virus in whatever form or mutation or variation will be with us for a while, and thus it's worth talking even now about that medium term. And here, too, the WTO can remind us and has that uh, whether it's the uh, ingredients that go into a vaccine or the equipment or supplies, they need to move between countries. Uh, there's uh, illustrations galore that pharmaceutical ingredients need to be drawn from several countries. And where they're actually produced and where the vials are filled may vary across borders. So open trade is necessary, uh, even in uh, ramping up uh, production and distribution. So the WTO is not an impediment. It's actually a guardrail to keep the system uh, going in response. Thank you, Jonathan. I think we kind of covered all the aspects of trade and health, but in my humble opinion, I think we experienced severe uh, problems in supply chain during the during the COVID nineteen period, especially coming from you know uh, big producers of of health uh, medical products. So um, perhaps, as you said, uh, interinstitutional um, cooperation with private sector, of course, included, um, would uh, secure uh, for the future, at least, the supply of at least these, you know, health-wise uh, essential products and their supply in every single part of the world and not only its certain parts. Uh, having said that, well, I think given the time constraints, I will just now turn the page to our second and equally important discussion, which is uh, on trade and environment. Well. Uh, you know, public reaction to uh, environmental problems doubly increased in the most recent years. Well, so did the gravity of environmental problems. Um, so countries' um, ambitious Paris Agreement targets, um, as well as an implementation of local laws and regulations uh, limiting the pollution. Well, if you consider all these, you can conclude that there is a global movement towards green transformation although the pace of this improvement is kind of questionable. Uh, looking at this issue from a global trade perspective, what do you think is happening in WTO system with respect to WTO reform, promoting sustainability? Uh, where do member states and the WTO stand in negotiating environmental rules and actions, such as, for instance, in the case of border tax, tax adjustments? Um, the WTO fail to keep the pace in ensuring environmental protection. Well, Ricardo, let's start with you. Would you like to comment on this first? Well, th th thank you very much um, uh, for bringing this up. Uh, I think, um, let me start perhaps by the, the last part in your question. Has the WTO really kept up with um, the concerns and challenges on environment? And, and the response, unfortunately, unfortunately, is not, but we're going to get there. I mean, what is really the issue with the WTO today? It is an, an incredibly important system for the global economy to, to keep really uh, markets functioning, but it's not sufficient and it's not sufficient in a number of areas. And we will probably get there when we, when we talk about WTO reform. Now on the environment specifically, um, let's just separate two things very quickly. One is uh, all the environmental issues and then climate change. On, on all other environmental issues, mm -hmm. yes, the WTO through the, the, its existence has demonstrated that it is able to uh, really 
uh, support governments in taking environmental action uh, when the action is not uh, a disguised uh, way of uh, protectionism. Uh, just put it in very simple terms. And we have very good jurisprudence, if that's what we can call uh, sort of the experience with disputes uh, in the past 30 years in that regard. And so so that's, but, but again, it's, it's not yet sufficient when it comes to problems like, for instance, subsidies that affect uh, overfishing, illegal fishing, uh, subsidies to uh, to fossil fuels uh, that that uh, damage the, the, the climate and the environment, uh, and and so on. Right now, there is, as you all know, a negotiation on fishery subsidies. We are expecting that with a good Colombian chair of the negotiations, and uh, and again, the weight of the uh, new mm-hmm. director general behind it, and a commitment by governments after um, more than twenty years of negotiations. Uh, we will probably get to to an outcome soon. Uh, now that outcome will probably take care, and I'm just reading on a crystal ball of some of the music breakers forms of subsidizing fisheries that could be connected to overfishing or illegal fishing. Um, it will hopefully do more than that in order to be effective. But but that's that's actually a good illustration of the point I want to make, which is that the WTO doesn't operate in isolation in, in the global governance uh, ecosystem. Uh, there has to be uh, also uh, the complementarity of other international mm-hmm. law instruments uh, so that uh, the WTO can act where it is a trade-related issue that is uh, really uh, getting on the way, for instance, of, of environmental uh, objectives. Now, to climate change very quickly, it's a, it's a mm-hmm. very complex issue, but, but you, you're right. We are um, sort of against the clock on uh, what, we should be, what should be deep decarbonization of the economy. Uh, the WTO needs to to uh, be supportive of the carbonization efforts. Uh, we have seen the national determined uh, contributions that governments have had in the Paris Agreement and how they're related to trade. They can use trade to help in this decarbonization in many ways, but also uh, they have to be wary of trade and trade rules getting in the way of the one of their ambition. And so one of these issues is what do you do with when different countries or regions have uh, different, uh, there's a heterogeneity, if you like, in the way that they address climate change. And this is what we're seeing in the European, uh, in the case of the European uh, Union and their effort now uh, to secure a level playing field in, um, again, how onerous their climate policy may be on uh, on other, uh, on, on their own uh, producers and their own manufacturers. Now, the, the important thing here is that they should not do it because they are internalizing the environmental cost to, uh, in, in the case of those industries, but they should do it because uh, creating problems of competitiveness is going to, to lead to uh, leakage of carbon uh, emissions. So industries may migrate to other jurisdictions and they would actually aggravate the problem uh, uh, of climate change. And so is this WTO consistent or not? And there's a, there's a beautiful um, sort of circus of uh, fascinating of academics and experts uh, going on around the world. And, uh, and I've been part of this for the past many years trying to uh, basically assure governments that they can do what they should do if they yeah. design the systems in a way that they're not discriminatory and that they don't affect, again, the competitive um, sort of level playing field uh, among nations and, and that they do purposefully address the climate change problem. So the, the, the WTO has much to do with this. I mean, to your question, there's um, now there's a good sign 53 countries have have a sponsor what is called now a structural uh, discussions on uh, environment and sustainable development. There may be a need, and I've been a proposal of this, a proponent of this, there may be a need for the trade and then the climate and energy communities to get together. Actually, the intergovernmental bodies of, of the WTO, the UNFCCC, those that have to deal with these issues and uh, and try to, to sort uh, what are the best rules uh, to go forward and to do it as fast as is necessary so that uh, we can really uh, achieve, again, the, the objectives that we have in front of us. Okay. 
So, um, well, um, Ricardo mostly covered everything, but uh, I still want to kind of get a few words from Jonathan, in especially kind of if there is anything that you need to add, or perhaps my question would be a bit more, you know, towards side of um, trade agreements, uh, for, you know, potential trade agreements or international uh, or, or even bilateral agreements that we see at, at this a tendency towards, you know, making, a, you know, at, at least adding some sustainability clauses or um, even um, how can we make, you know, the supply chain greener or more resilient? Uh, do you think uh, there is also an improvement or a, pl or, or a room to improve for this? Uh, in the well, I'm going to be very brief because Carla, yeah. working in the energy sector, will have much to say. Yes. Sure. So the two points are as follows. Yes, there are some interesting uh, 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 guideposts that we can see in bilateral and plurilateral agreements in North America. The revised NAFTA, the so-called USMCA, uh, provides both for environmental cooperation between the three uh, countries, but also an enforcement mechanism if countries are not adequately enforcing yes. uh, environmental standards. Similar language, less, uh, less uh, discipline, however, in the Comprehensive and Progressive uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, to take a second example. That's point one. Point two, even before the structured discussions that Ricardo uh, flagged come to fruition, um, the uh, more immediate uh, issue may come up mm -hmm. depending on how quickly the, the European Union moves to implement its green plan, which anticipates a carbon price at home and a carbon tax or fee at yep. the border. It's part of President Biden's uh, climate agenda to contemplate a border so-called mechanism. We don't know exactly what that means. Yeah. Um, but as Ricardo said, there's lots of debate as to whether the current rules can accommodate a border adjustment tax for climate purposes. Uh, and the center of opinion seems to say it totally depends on the design. Exactly. Uh, to ensure non-discrimination. And that debate will come earlier rather than later. But let right. me uh, hand it over to Cola for his Exactly. Offer. So we're all, we're all quite interested to hear uh, Cola's perspective on that, and especially from the business perspective, what do you think about the efforts put, you know, by businesses or, or also by the WTO and its member states on sustainable development and environmental protection in general? Okay. Uh, thank you uh, once again. Um, mine is this. Um, it depends on what you're looking at and where you're looking <laughs> at the uh, issue from. Um, part of what I've said, uh, timelessly are different for us. Africa still suffers from the challenge of availability as well as affordability. Yeah. So uh, endemic poverty has made it a challenge for Africa to rapidly uh, industrialize and be able to do uh, in, engage in trade uh, the way we desire. Part of the problem I've seen is the fact that, uh, yeah, sustainability as an agenda, it's welcoming, it's desirable. But the question is, where we are today, uh, is uh, at the top priority for us as an agenda, is it sustainability? In Africa, I think the answer is no. The answer today is still poverty eradication is still to cure unemployment and the rest of that. Um, speak to an African businessman with regards to coal fire power plant, whilst my own organization will never, ever consider that anymore, arising from our own agenda and where we are as an organization. You still find quite a number of uh, countries in Africa, South Africa, for instance, they are still fire power plant. So environmental concern is not a priority to them as yet. Just still thinking of how do we really stay alive, stay afloat, and remain relevant to our own people so that we can take them out of uh, the morass of uh, poverty and make them a bit comfortable. Now, the question is, how do you do that? You can only do that if you accelerate the pace of technology in terms of the cost of the alternative energy that you are presenting. The lower the cost, the higher the propensity for them to say, yes, we are ad adopting this as a new way of life. 
uh, environmental impact assessment, part of what I've said here in Africa is the fact that if uh, those of us in business and even government, we show the outcome of environmental impact assessment to our citizens, the chances are there that they will be more uh, prone for green energy than the current uh, conventional energy that we're using. And ultimately, that will be beneficial to the system. But because of the level of poverty, nobody's paying attention to that. So for me, it's first the mindset. We must have a mindset that is global, but yet take into consideration the local realities. Now, how do we now help countries that are backward and suffering to move at the pace of the globe? That's the question that needs to be answered. The second thing for me is the priority. The priority to Africa is not the priority to the world today. Africa is still suffering from debt obligation. Uh, there is lack of uh, infrastructure. Medical equipment is lacking behind. So, much, so many things are, are challenging us today. Half of Africa is still in the dark. So invariably, you want to ask yourself, how do you tell such a person that he should be thinking about sustainable uh, energy or any of those things? He's not going to listen to you. Now, again, for me, when you look at the number of people vaccinated in Africa today, just 13 million people out of 1.7 billion people, 13 million people have been vaccinated. Now, so if the world lives in the bubble, the other world lives in the bubble that, okay, we are okay. We travel, I travel, I'm fully vaccinated. I'm one of the few that is fully vaccinated in Africa. So how do you now ensure that we get vaccines to Africa in order to cure the problem of health care and the rest of them. So these are some of the challenges we have. The number of uh, ventilators for the whole of Africa today is about 2,000. Just 2,000 ventilators, the whole of Africa. So, you, you, so imagine what level of uh, challenge we are likely to face. Thankfully, the, the scorch didn't come here the way it went around the world, so we've been able to contain it fairly well. My own organization built a 300-bed uh, isolation center just in Nigeria. And how many beds do we have by way of isolation center in the whole country? <laughs> Probably just about uh, 5,000. And I alone just did 300, and that is insufficient, you know, to be able to carry uh, Africa forward, particularly Nigeria. Now, for me, uh, should carbon tax be enacted? There's a question, that's a question that we need to answer. But if you continue to have the Russians of this world blocking some of these agreements, there's no unanimity of opinion regarding the carbon element in our world today. So everybody has, they have their own different views and they are all standing by their own border. They are all thinking about self, 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 self. So until we really, really, truly come to understand the enormity of the crisis that the future is portending, we're not likely to get out of the wood fairly quickly. But it's something that needs to engage the attention of WTO if truly that organization wants to be effective and efficient. Thank you, Kolo. I think um, we, should, we really shouldn't forget that trade um, can help countries to adapt uh, themselves to, to, as you said, to local realities um in a global mindset so that so there must be a common understanding of what's going on in the world and the response must be also the same otherwise the efforts that they put in uh facilitating trade among nations doesn't make much sense to me either so i totally agree with you so uh, we're running out of time so i'm gonna switch right now let's just you know focus on a little bit to the interinstitutional public order of the wto and where do where does WTO and other institutions, where do they stand? Um, what are the prospects of coordinating governments uh, with the WTO? Um, how should member states, other stakeholders deal with the lack of coordination in the global governance? As Kola said, there's this reality going on, but the coordination among the representatives of the governments are still you know, a reality. And we have the um, perfect example here of COVID-19. So, I'm gonna keep my uh, questions super short. Uh, would a more advanced level of cooperation between WTO and other institutions such as WHO or any other institution with another X institution be more fruitful? So Jonathan, Ricardo, Cola, 
uh, any of you? Well, very briefly, when we talk about these issues, there's a tendency to say the institutions need to talk to each other. But remember, every one of these institutions is not so much international as intergovernmental. They are owned by their shareholders who are governments. And thus, it's the positions that governments bring to that table rather than the secretariats that are authoritative. That means what has to be fostered is coordination in national capitals between ministries and internationally to convene not only between governments, but relevant stakeholders. And I'm not sure any of the relevant organizations has yet grown into the 21st century uh, reality of multi-stakeholder governance. Maybe in the uh, information technology field, uh, where the players help to set the standards, it's more advanced, but the WTO, the WHO, and others can be more transparent, more engaged, and have more meaningful uh, dialogue uh, in addition to the formality of a once-a-year meeting with the International Chamber of Commerce uh, and so on. We're seeing some examples in some committees of uh, self-starting outreach, but more can be done. I'll keep it short in light of the time. Um, is there any other comment from other? Yeah, no, no, just just very quickly. I think that the, the, the question of coordination is, is very critical. Uh, the question of the linkages between different uh, poli policies, uh, so tr trade policy and other mm -hmm. issues uh, handled by other international organizations is absolutely critical. Uh, the, the world uh, counts on the G20, I think, but also other uh, instruments of coordination, the G7, the BRICS, and so on, uh, to try to, to bring together some of the syntheses and some of the, uh, at least, uh, uh, coordination. Just let, let me just make one more plea again on the question of, of climate and energy, because it's so, so urgent. But I think that... Um, Ideally, we should have systematically, uh, for instance, every year, uh, a meeting of trade and, and uh, of, of ministers responsible for energy and trade or authorities responsible for energy, trade and climate. And this should take place in a way that um, what transpires there could trickle down to the institutions that take care of the governance on those issues. Um, Less than that, uh, as, as Jonathan said, I mean, this is intergovernmental. It has to be the governments that coordinate. So less than that, having the secretariat is very important. Uh, it has proven to be uh, actually incredibly fruitful in the past uh, 10, 10 or 12 years of the, of the G20 experience, but it's not sufficient. Uh, so on those issues, as it, as it was the case with health as well, we do need something like a crisis uh, management or, or some sort of rapid uh, deployed uh, device among governments that could take up coordination and move things forward. Yes, hold on. Yeah, for me, um, coordination is only possible when there is shared understanding and shared perspective. Without that, you can't coordinate anything. You must have a goal that you've all agreed to and then it makes coordination easy. Part of what we uh, have as a challenge in the world is that there is no unanimity of opinion regarding most of the subject matter that will, I consider relevant to take the world to where the world should belong. Technology, yes, information technology, that's about the only place where we have borderless uh, economy and globalization. In every other area, you have restrictions of different user rights uh, limiting the capacity of mankind to work together. So that for me really uh, is the first thing. How do we achieve shared values, shared perspective, shared understanding, shared goal, then for us now say, spell out the steps, the processes and the system uh, towards which we can achieve the goal and somebody will be coordinating at WTO. Until we get to that level where we have a uh, unanimity of opinion, I think we'll just be cycling around. Well, I assume that um, an interesting part of this discussion and also our final uh, question uh, would relate to um, 
the um, non-sharing of this um, one single goal or let's say ambition or purpose, how do you call it? So um, let's discuss then the 